Of all the prophecies in the Bible, without doubt, the prophecy of the 2,300 days found in Daniel 8, verse 14, is one of the most important. <clears throat> it firstly provides proof that Jesus is the Messiah, the Saviour. And secondly, it points to his work as priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary and helps to identify his true church in the last days. It provides the justification for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a distinct and separate uh, organization or denomination. To clearly understand how this prophecy and its subdivisions found in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 relate to history, it would be helpful to be able to see an outline diagram as shown below. Also shown in this diagram is the 100 the 1,260-day period or years, the prophecy of Revelation 13, uh, th 11, verse 3, rather, which deals with the time period that Scripture says the papal power would rule supreme and persecute God's people. And there we see the scene. We have the beginning date, which we have already established, as uh, 457 BC, and the 2,300-day period, goes over to 1844, and here we have the 1260-day period or years, papal domination and persecution in Europe. And then we have the two divisions that are given to us in Daniel 9 of the subdivisions that come off the front of the 2000 days, the 69 weeks or 483 years, bringing down to the baptism of Jesus. <coughs> and... <coughs> the 70 weeks coming down to the end where Stephen was stoned and the gospel went to the Gentiles. In the middle of this week, the Bible tells us Jesus would cause the sacrifices and oblation to cease. He did that in AD 31 by his death on the cross. <clears throat> now, there's one thing that I've learned over the years that I have been engaged in gospel work. And that is that the devil hates certain books of the Bible more than others. He hates the book of Genesis. Why? Because it's the book of beginnings. And most of the world has turned away from the record of Genesis and its creation story and substituted evolution. Therefore, you don't need a God. You go into atheistic evolution, and certainly you don't have in a basis for a Sabbath if you don't believe in the creation week. Another book that is hated by <clears throat> the devil is the book of Isaiah, which we have been studying in Sabbath school lessons in this particular quarter. Because the book of Isaiah is the strong book of the Old Testament to foretell the coming of the Messiah. It's called the Messianic prophet because he spoke about the coming of Jesus more than any other prophet of the Old Testament. Then he hates the Gospels because they give us the story of the life of Jesus. And in recent decades, scholars, liberals, have entered into a practice what they call form criticism. Not so much higher criticism, but form criticism. Form criticism uh, can be defined by saying that <clears throat> they take a particular form or a group of words or a saying from the Gospels and say, oh, Jesus didn't say that. That doesn't sound like Jesus. Uh, somebody else put that in. And so they rubbish the record of the Gospels. And then, of course, we have the book of Revelation, which one man said, if you're not crazy when you start to read it, you'll be crazy by the time you're finished. <laughs> it's a book of symbols and not always easy to understand, but the Bible helps you to understand. <clears throat> but I come back now to the book of Daniel, which is, uh, I'm sure the devil hates this book, because as we saw in a previous lecture, the beginning date for the 2,300 days is 457 BC, 
And that takes us down to the baptism of Jesus in AD 27, as you see on the chart here. And the devil hates anything that proves that Jesus is the saviour of the world. And so the book of Daniel has been criticised. It said Daniel never wrote it. It was written by somebody else in the intertestament period. And I've already answered that in a le le previous lecture that uh, Daniel did write the book of Daniel, the book that bears his name. And the prophecies in it are God-given and have come true in history as we have seen and can see. To clearly understand how this prophecy and its subdivisions found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 27 to 29, relate to history, we need to look at this diagram and understand it. And we have <coughs> explained it briefly to you. Throughout history, there have been various attacks launched against the prophecy of the 2,300 days. We have recognized these attacks as originating with Satan in his attempt to discredit this prophecy because he wants to divert people's attention away from the fact that Jesus is the savior of the world and that God has a remnant people in the last days that will uphold his truth. Satan's attempts to discredit <coughs> uh, these records, these prophecies, is to turn people away so that they will not be saved in God's kingdom when Jesus comes. These attacks include the denial that the book of Daniel was written by Daniel, which I have just mentioned, in the time of the Babylonian Empire, and uh, attack the chronological dating of the decree given in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, namely 457 BC, as the beginning date for the prophecy. It also includes an attack on the date for the appearance of the Messiah at the end of the 69 weeks, when his baptism took place and confusion regarding the events and precise date that marked the end of the prophecy. <clears throat> In a previous chapter, a previous lecture, I've dealt with the evidence for the beginning date of the prophecy, namely 457 BC, the decree of Artaxerxes. It is the only decree that fulfills the specifications of the prophecy that we read about in Ezra 7 and Daniel 9. I have also dealt with the authorship and date of the book of Daniel in a previous lecture. In this lecture, I propose to present evidence for the date for the baptism of Jesus as AD 27, and the events that surround the end of the prophetic timeline, what happened in 1843-44. To do this, we will have to look at the relationship between BC dates and AD dates. And what happens when we cross that dividing line in history? We will also need to know how people in New Testament times counted the reigns of kings and rulers and what type of calendar they used. First of all, let's look at the date for the baptism of Jesus. In all of the New Testament, we have only been given one date linked to the reign of a ruler or a king. It is the date for the baptism of Jesus. It's found in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. That in itself should alert us to the fact that this is an important piece of information. Here we are told that Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. From reliable Roman records, we know that Tiberius Caesar came to rule on the death of Augustus. And the date of the death of Augustus was the 19th of August, AD 14. Without any regard for the way ancient people reckoned the reigns of their kings and without any regard to the type of calendar they used, Jehovah's Witnesses and others, just add the two figures together and get the following result, as you will see. 14 plus 15. 14 being the date of the beginning of the reign of uh, Tiberius and the 15th year being the year of his reign in which Jesus was baptized. You add the two together and what do you get? 29. This date we will show later on to be incorrect. Now looking at Daniel's prophecy, some come up with another date 
which will also later be shown to be incorrect. What do they do? Daniel 9.25 tells us that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem till the Messiah, the prince, would be 69 weeks. That would be 483 days and taking each day for a literal year, which is an accepted practice known to Bible scholars, including non-Adventist ones. See Numbers 14.34, Ezekiel 4.6. It would be 483 years. Now, the word Messiah in the Hebrew is the word for the Greek word Christos. Or in English, it's Christ. And both mean, both Messiah and Christos in their respective languages mean the same thing, the anointed one. Jesus was anointed, as the Bible tells us, with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. See Acts 10, verse 38. The 69 weeks therefore reach to the baptism of Jesus. Taking the beginning date for the prophecy, we have shown it in the beginning, in the previous lecture, we have the following. 483 minus the beginning date, 457. And what do you get? AD 26. This date also is not correct, as we will see in a few moments. The problem why this date is not correct hinges on the problem of the change from BC to AD dates. We do our mathematical work in what we call base 10, 0 to 9. That is, there are 10 digits in the sequence. 0 to 9, 10 to 19, and so on. Mathematics may be done in any base system. For example, some ancient civilizations, such as uh, the Persians, used base 6. Traces of base 6 can still be seen in some of our usage. For example, we have numbers that are, have fract six as one of their fractions or factors. We have 360 degrees in a circle. It's part of a base six system. Base six system. Modern computers use base two so that uh, a switch is either on or off. It would be very hard for us to do all our mathematical calculations in base 2. So when a computer has done its work, it has to convert the answer into base 10 so that we can understand it. The feature of base 10 mathematics is that in any series of 10 numbers, there will always be a number that can be divided by the base without a remainder left over. In order, <clears throat> in other words, there will always be a number with a zero in the series. You can start anywhere you want to. Start from 15 and go to 25, and you've got a zero in there, 20. One that's divided by the base and no remainder. 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever that may be. Every series of 10 numbers will have a zero number in it. Now, when historians and chronologists made the change from B.C. to A.D., they did not follow this mathematical rule. B.C. dates run backwards, while A.D. rates run forwards, as we will be see in the next illustration. When they came to the changeover, they went straight from 1 B.C. to A.D. 1, as shown in the chart above. There it is. One BC, one AD. Now you take ten digits from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is there a zero in there anywhere? No. That's because they broken the mathematical rule when you're doing calculations in base 10. But chronologists and 
archaeologists and astronomers, when they are doing their work, they use the proper mathematical sequence. They put in a year zero. 1 AD, AD 1, 2, 3, 4 and on are the same as we have for the historians. But they put a zero in there where we have 1 BC. They put zero. Their BC dates then are minus numbers. So minus 1 is the date 2 in the historian BC dates. Minus 2 is 3. Same here. Minus 3 is 4, minus 4 is 5, and so on. Some years ago, I was uh, challenged by somebody to produce evidence of a certain archaeological tablet that I had dis just discussed, and which I did incidentally show on the long chart that I have told you about in the previous lecture that you can get copies of. <coughs> there was a, a um, e eclipse in there that re recorded the accurate dates of it, <coughs> but the uh, information is uh, helpful to us to realize that here we have a correct sequence, zeros, Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. I was challenged to produce the evidence for what I had said in my lectures. VAT 4956 was the document found in the Berlin Museum, giving events for the 37th year of Nebuchadnezzar, during which year there was an eclipse. This eclipse locks the reign of Nebuchadnezzar into certain years in the BC scale which this particular ind individual didn't agree with, and so he wanted to get a copy of this document to examine it for himself. I did not have a copy of it. I knew about it, but I didn't have a copy of it. So I knew it was in the Berlin Museum, so I wrote a letter to the Berlin Museum and asked them for a copy. They sent me a copy. When it came in the mail, I opened it up, and lo and behold, it was all in the German language, because what else would you expect of something coming from, Ber from Berlin? It was in German, and I don't read German. So I wrote a letter to the University of Sydney, and I said, do you have a lecturer down in your university teaching in the modern languages department that can translate a German document for me? I'm willing to pay for the translation. And they acknowledged that they had such a person, and so I sent it down to them, and I got a copy in English. But the date for the eclipse was given in the minus number, not in the BC number. Because that's what the astronomers do. The eclipse is given in a minus number, illustrating what we have here on the screen. The BC dates among astronomers are in minus, minus numbers. And it was one different from the BC date given in the other system. I put that in just as an illustration to prove that what I've been saying is the case in fact. Now we will see that the dates used by astronomers for years before Christ are all in minus numbers and are one lower or less than the number used by historians and chronologists. For example, 1 BC becomes 0, the year 2 BC becomes minus 1, and so on, as I've already explained. Now if we count from a period, the next picture please, five years, from 3 BC, we take 3 away from 5, what is the answer? 2. But if you do a count, you come down not to 2, but to 3. But if you have the system used by the astronomers, and you take from 5, from minus 2, 2 from 5 is 3, and you get 3. That illustrates for us this problem of not having a year, a, year, a year zero in the sequence of the numbers during the turnover from BC to AD dates. Now it's interesting when William Miller was doing his calculations for the prophecies, he uh, 
subtracted <coughs> the period of uh, 69 weeks away from 457, and he got uh, a wrong number for the baptism of Jesus. And he got a wrong number for the end of the 2,300 days. He got it as 1843 instead of 1844. As you can see from these examples, to get the correct answer in your calculation from BC to AD dates, you have to plus one to the answer. If you just do the mathematical subtraction, you have to plus one to your answer to get the correct date on the AD side. That is the rule that must be followed to be correct, and that is the rule that many people have failed to do when they changed over from BC to AD, and that's why so many of them got the wrong dates on the other side, including William Miller, who subtracted <coughs> uh, the date and got 1843 as the end of the 2,300 days and was preaching it and teaching it, but of course, as we'll see a little later on, nothing happened in 1843 because he was in error. And I'll talk more about that in a few moments. Now let us look at the date for the baptism of Jesus. Remember that we get the correct answer when we add one because there is no year zero in the sequence. The 69 weeks of the prophecy give us 483 days or literal years. The beginning date is 457 BC. So we now subtract 457 from 483 and we get the answer of 26. But then we have to add one to get the correct answer, and we add 1 to 26, and we get 27. So that is the correct date for the baptism of Jesus, according to calculations, beginning with 457 BC. Thus we can see that the correct date for the baptism of Jesus, according to the prophecy, is AD 27. We will now turn our attention to the evidence from the Bible and history to show that this date is correct. According to Luke 3, 1 to 23, Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We have previously noted that he began his reign when Augustus died on the 19th of August, AD 14. Now 14 plus 15 is 29. So how do we harmonize history with the Bible evidence? To do this, we will need to know what kind of calendar was used in the time of Jesus and how people in those days counted the reigns of their rulers. In the chapter which established the date 457 BC for the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel 8.14, we note that the Jews were using a fall to fall calendar, autumn to autumn, for counting the reign not only of their own kings but also foreign kings, in that case Persian kings. However, during the reign of the Maccabees, which is in the intertestament period, before the coming of Jesus, a historical period known as the Maccabean period, <clears throat> Jews used a spring-to-spring -spring calendar for their Maccabean kings. Why? Because they came from the priestly family. Mathathias, the father of the Maccabean brothers and descendants, were priests and the priests are tied in with their religious services with a spring-to-spring -spring calendar. And so we find that they were using a spring-to-spring -spring calendar when they counted the reigns of their kings. No doubt the Maccabean kings, who were religious leaders, uh, used that system. History also tells us that in the Intertestament period, or from about the time of Alexander the Great onwards, the use of the accession year system of counting the reign of kings was discontinued and the non-accession year system of counting the reigns of kings was introduced. You'll find evidence for this in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 245 in footnote number 8. We will now see how the baptism of Jesus took place in the autumn of AD 27 using the fall-to-fall -fall calendar and the non-accession year method of counting the reigns of kings. And there we have it.
our Julian calendar, Augustus, dying in the 14th year of his reign. But instead of this being called the accession year, this little period in here, just about a few weeks or a few months or two, on a non-accession year system of counting, it becomes year one. And then year two, three, four, five, six, on down to 15, follow. And when you recognize that, a fall-to-fall -fall calendar and a non-accession year reckoning, you come down here to the end of the chart where we have the baptism of Jesus there, and there in the 15th year, overlapping the end of the 27th year, we have Jesus' baptism, where those two red stars are showing. 15th year, and it was the end of the 27th year of the reign of Tiberius, uh, reign of AD date, uh, dates and the 15th year of Tiberius, and so we have the proof that uh, the system works. Now we want to look at the problem that some people have raised. Some people don't want to acknowledge that there are links between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. See, Daniel 8 verse 14 talks about the 2,300 days, but the 69 weeks and the 70 weeks are in chapter 9. And some people claim that there's no connection between these two chapters. Earlier in this chapter, I referred to the attacks of most non-Adventist scholars who attack our teaching about 1844 by claiming that Daniel 8 and 9 are not connected. If their claims are true, that there is no connection then between the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14 and the 69 weeks and the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, therefore they have no beginning date for the 2,300-day prophecy. The only beginning date in the two chapters is the one found in Daniel 9.25. That then means that the 2,300 days means nothing to them. It is meaningless, and that's why probably they never talk about it. I'm not aware of much being said in other denominations about this 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. They just ignore it. They're silent about it. They have no way of understanding it or of making any application of it. Even some Seventh-day Adventists influenced by such suggestions have fallen into this trap and can give no explanation for this timeline prophecy which we believe. We will now present three lines of argument that clearly show that these two chapters are linked together and constitute the third great prophecy that Daniel's book presents. The following is a collection of parallel concepts seen when you compare these two chapters. And I have gathered this from a former colleague of mine. Both chapters revolve around the sanctuary saying it would be trodden down, then cleansed or restored. Daniel 8, 14, Daniel 9, 26. Also the sacrifices are mentioned, Daniel 9, 21 and verse 27. Both refer to Christ and the Antichrist as the protagonists in the war over the sanctuary. Daniel 8, 11, Daniel 9, 23. Jesus quoted from both Daniel 8 and 9, Trials and tribulations are mentioned in both Daniel 8.13, Luke 21.24, Daniel 8.7, and Matthew 25.15, uh, 24.15. Both chapters are dated to the late Babylonian period of history and the early Medo-Persian Medo period, which followed Babylon. Both deal with judgments on the Antichrist power. Read Daniel 8.25 and Daniel 9.27 which says that the power that desolates will be desolated. That's the marginal reading of the King James Bible. And both chapters bring in everlasting righteousness. So there's a whole list there of one, two, three, four, five, six arguments, six different topics showing the links between the two chapters. 
So they're very much uh, connected. Now I want to use a second argument. An argument based on the Hebrew words Chazon and Marei. The vision of Daniel 8 of the ram and the he-goat together with the sanctuary and the time period of the 2,300 days representing 2,300 years of literal time must have caused Daniel extreme concern. It is evident that he did not understand what the interpretations were. The prophecy needed to be explained to him. And he records in Daniel 8 and verse 16 that the angel Gabriel was commissioned to explain it all to him. In the following verses, Gabriel explained to him that the ram represented Medo-Persia and that the goat represented Greece. The single horn on the goat was the first great king, which would be Alexander the Great, and that when it was broken, four other horns came up in its place. When Alexander died, his empire did for some time divide into four divisions. Later, another horn power would arise out of one of the four winds, the four points of the compass. This horn represents pagan and papal Rome that would attack the sanctuary. Here we see the parallel with Daniel 7, which speaks of the terrible beast and the little horn power that would attack God's people and think to change God's law. However, this power would be broken without hand, that is, by God. God himself would take care of the power and destroy it one day. In Daniel 8, verse 25. Up to this point, Gabriel had said nothing about the time period of the 2,300 days. It was the only part of the prophecy that was not yet explained. However, it appears that he began to explain it to, da to Daniel by saying that it shall be for many days. Daniel 8, 26. At this point, Daniel was so overcome that he fainted. No further explanation was then possible. Gabriel could not explain anything more to him while he was in an unconscious state. The chapter ends with Daniel saying that nobody understood it. In context, he was referring to the time period of the 2,300 days, of course, because you could easily understand the media, Persia and Greece by the symbols of the goat and the ram, ram and the goat. All right. That Daniel was perplexed over this time period appears to be the basis of the prayer that he prayed in the early verses of Daniel chapter 9. He says that he had been studying the prophecies of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 verse 10, where he prophesied that the captivity in Babylon would last for 70 years. Daniel must have thought that God had changed his mind about the 70 years and that they would remain in captivity for the next 2,300 years. No wonder he was overcome. The burden of his prayer after confession of sins was an appeal to God to allow his people to return to the promised land and rebuild the city and the sanctuary. In Daniel 9 verse 19, he pleaded with God. And he said in that pleading, to God, defer not, don't delay. Let us go back home to Palestine. Let us rebuild the city and the sanctuary. While praying this prayer, Daniel recorded that Gabriel, whom he had seen before in the vision at the beginning, appeared to him and invited him to consider the vision. I'm quoting now James King James Bible, Daniel 9, 21 and 23. I'd seen Gabriel had seen this, uh, Daniel had seen Gabriel in the vision at the beginning, and Gabriel now says, consider the vision. Immediately, Gabriel began to talk about time periods, namely the 70 weeks and the 69 weeks. The 70 weeks or 490 days of literal years referred to the time that God allowed to the Jews as his people 
and the 69 weeks or 483 years of little time would reach down to the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, or in other words, the coming of Jesus, his baptism. Now the English language, King James Version, does not reveal in detail what is clearly shown in the Hebrew text in these verses. The word vision that appears twice in Daniel 9, 21 and 23 in the Hebrew text actually comes from two different words in the Hebrew. Daniel had seen Gabriel in the vision of Daniel 9, 21. There the original word for vision is chazon. This word means the whole vision, the large vision, and in context must refer to the vision given in Daniel chapter 8. However, in Daniel 9 verse 23, he is told to consider the vision, and here a different word is used. The word is mare, which is a word used for a small part of a vision, a section of a vision. In context, it is referring to that part of the vision that Gabriel had not explained in chapter 8. That part, of course, is the time period of the 2,300 days that had not been explained to him. Knowledge of the meaning of these two Hebrew words strongly support the belief that these two chapters of Daniel are linked together. Attempts to argue that these two chapters are not linked together cannot be accepted. Robert Young, the analytical concordance of the Hebrew Bible entries, you can look up and see there, Chazon and Mare for yourself. Now we have a third argument that shows that these two chapters are linked together. When Daniel 8 began to explain, when Gabriel began to explain to Daniel the subdivision of the 2,300 days, he first of all stated in Daniel 9.27 that 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Almost all English translations use the word determined. A few use the words allocated or decreed or some other words that have the same or similar meaning. No doubt, scholars have seen in this wording that a period of 490 years is here intended as a time for the Hebrew people to enjoy the special status of being God's chosen people. However, the word kathak does have other meanings. In fact, it may come as a surprise to many that determined is not the primary meaning of this word. The primary meaning of the word is to cut off. A secondary meaning includes the idea of to decree or to determine. And you can see that in uh, Genesis Hebrew lexicon, Chaldee lexicon, or you can look it up on the internet, and I have the reference in the notes here. There are some who have been told, as been, sorry, there have some who have been so bold as to declare that no Hebrew scholar will tell you that kathak means cut off. They are, of course, trying to build an argument that Daniel 8 and 9 are not connected. Seeing this evidence as to what is the truth, seeking the evidence as to what is the truth or not of these claims, my brother, Pastor Athel H. Tolhurst, while serving in the administration of the South Pacific Division area, was once attending committee meetings in the General Conference in the USA. <clears throat> While at Andrews University, he went to the library and asked the librarian, where can I find your collection of Hebrew lexicons? Lexicon is a book giving you a Hebrew word and English meaning. Hebrew word, English meaning. It's like a bilingual dictionary. He was shown a collection of 17 lexicons, different lexicons, 17 of them. One by one, he looked at each one. And there he found 14 of them gave the primary or the first meaning of kathak as being cut off. Only three said decreed or determined, was the main meaning. 
And you can read his article, which was printed in the Australasian Record, October 22, 1983, on page 6. <clears throat> the word kathak is the word or is related to the Hebrew word for circumcision. The 70 weeks of time cannot be cut off from nothing. They have to be cut off from a larger time period. We therefore stand on the ground, ling sound, linguistic and exegetical platform where we interpret Daniel 9.24 as being linked to Daniel 8.14. We do accept, <clears throat> to accept any other renderings would be to a violation of the evidence. The SDA Bible Dictionary, volume 4, page 851. All right, let's look now at the events of what happened in 1843, 1844. I mentioned earlier that William Miller, studying this 2,300-day prophecy, thought that he had a prophecy that would refer to the coming of Jesus to the world, to put an end to sin. But he was not aware of the year naught problem. So in doing his calculation after he used the Ptolemy's canon to get the date 457 BC and was correct in doing so. He took away 457 from 2300 and you get the answer of 1843. There you see it on the screen. 2300 days or years, take away the beginning date and you get 1843. Why? Because of the new year naught problem. There's no year naught in there. So he began to preach and teach that Jesus was going to come in 1843. But when Jesus did not come in 1843, his disappointed followers asked him why Jesus had not come. Miller replied that Roman 1843 had passed, but that Jewish 1843 was still not yet expired, that it would last until the spring of 1844, another three months in effect around the end of March. Thus expectation was still kept alive by his, among his followers, many of them. But when Jesus did not come by the end of March, there was another real disappointment. At this time, many had to have joined the movement, just in case he was right, but were not really converted, left the movement. Ellen White said that God allowed Miller to make that mistake so that the movement would then be purified with the departure of those who were not really converted. You read early writings, page 235 and 236. From the end of March onward, much study was undertaken to try and find the reason for the failure of their expectations. Beginning date was re-examined and found to be correct, but it was not until mid-summer in the Northern Hemisphere that they realized that the 2,300 days actually reached to the autumn of 1844. Further study of the Old Testament sanctuary services, especially of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, when the earthly sanctuary was cleansed, led to the establishment of the date of October 22, 1844, as the date for the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, in 1844. Now, in recent years, some have pointed out from study of records from Jewish connections that Yom Kippur was not celebrated on October 22 by the Jewish people. They had it instead in date in September. The problem there is that the October 22 date was arrived at by using the method of calculating the Jewish Day of Atonement followed by the Karite Jews who had preserved the biblical method of reckoning at the 10th day of the 7th Jewish month Tishri as the Day of Atonement. Leaders in this new movement of understanding were Samuel S. Snow, Joshua V. Himes. Read The Midnight Cry by Francis F. D. Nickel, Francis D. Nickel, pages 219 to 230. Quite a long section there giving the history of this particular period. 
So you see, there were actually were three disappointments. Jesus didn't come at the end of 1843. He didn't come at the end of March 1844. And then we come to the date of October 22. Now the Jewish people had turned away from the biblical method of calculating the 10th day of the 7th month, Tishri. Why? Because it's linked with the barley harvest. And the barley harvest in Palestine came on October 22 that year. But many Jews were no longer living in Palestine. After the Babylonian captivity, not everybody came back to Judah. Many thousands of Jews stayed in Persia. Esther, Mordecai, we have the story of them. They were staying back there in Persia. They didn't go back to Palestine. And many other Jews went stayed in the, in the eastern countries of Iraq and Iran, but when they got persecuted there, they fled into Europe, like many people have done in recent years. Muslim people fleeing from Muslim countries because of war, flooding into Europe by the thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. And because the barley harvest in Europe came on a different date from the barley harvest in Palestine, they couldn't have their barley first sheaves of barley wave in their offerings by October. So they went to a different date and used a different formula. But the Karite Jews was a, a sect of the Jewish religion that broke away from the European folk and they preserved the knowledge of the biblical formula and it was the, ally, the early Adventist reformers that then went to the Karite Jews to get the correct biblical date and they got it from them as October 22 as the correct date for the 10th day of Tishri in 1844. But when Jesus did not come on that date, there was what we call the great disappointment. This realization that Jesus was expected on October 22 is called the beginning of the midnight cry. The Miller movement, therefore, did not collapse after the disappointment of the spring of 1844, but rapidly grew to a bigger movement than it was before. It has been claimed that in the remaining three to four months of that year, the news about the expectation of the return of Jesus on October 22 reached to many places around the world. Read Great Controversy 298-405, chapter there. When Jesus did not come as expected on that date, the believers were terribly disappointed. That's why it's called the Great Disappointment, because the other two previous ones were smaller. That is why it is called the Great Disappointment. However, on the next day, the 23rd of October, Hiram Edson and another man were walking across a field on their way to encourage others who were, be, were also disappointed. When about halfway across the field, he stopped and came to realize clearly that the cleansing of the sanctuary foretold in Daniel 8.14 was not the cleansing of the earth at the second coming, cleansing it by fire, but rather it involved the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary of the, um, in the priestly ministration of Christ before his return. This insight led to the intense study of the sanctuary services of the Old Testament and the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. From this judge study, this small group of Adventists came to the realization that Jesus had begun a work of judgment that must take place before he could cleanse the heavenly sanctuary of the record of the sins of his people. And so the doctrine of the pre-Advent judgment has now been adopted by the Adventist church. We used to call it the investigative judgment, but in recent years, the term pre-Advent judgment has become more common. Why? Because people have raised the question, why are you calling it a pre... Uh, why are you calling it an in, uh, investigative judgment? It's, what is God investigating? God is omniscient. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things. There's nothing he does not know. <laughs> God is not investigating to find out something he doesn't know. He knows who's going to be saved from eternity in the past. But he's doing an investigation because he's being watched by the universe, that's why. But to avoid that misunderstanding with some people, 
Adventists have been switching their terminology to the pre-Advent judgment. And I can tell you that in recent years, some theologians in non-Adventist circles, non-Adventist theologians, are now also agreeing with us that there must be a need a pre-Advent judgment before Jesus comes. Because in the book of Revelation we are told when he comes, he what? He brings his reward with him. So he's got to decide who's going to get the reward before he can bring it. So obviously there will be a pre-Advent judgment. And that has been one of the fundamental doctrines of the Seventh Adventist Church. We believe that it began on October 22 in 1844 when Jesus did not cease the work of the ministry of the first department, but entered into the ministry of the second department as well. In the later study, I'll develop that theme in more detail, and I'm sure you'll find that lecture of great interest also. May God bless us and strengthen our faith in his leadership of his church. Amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.